from the AM FM 24 7 radio network, broadcasting from AM and FM stations around the country. Welcome to the Small Business Administration award winning School for Startups Radio, where we talk all things small business and entrepreneurship. Now, here is your host, the guy that believes anyone can be a successful entrepreneur because entrepreneurship is not about creativity, risk, or passion, Jim Beach. Welcome back to School for Startups Radio. Thank you so much for being with us today. I hope you're using today to stay motivated and get out there and take control of your own life. Go start a business. Do something exciting with your life. I am very excited and honored to introduce you to my first guest today. We all know his company, the company that he was the CEO of, and it's an amazing story. I think you're going to really enjoy this. Jason Gardner was the CEO of Live Nation, which is the nation's largest concert promoter. As such, he traveled the world with famous rock stars and uh, sports legends, all of that. He even had dinner one time at George Clooney's house, and the other guest was some guy named President Barack Obama. You don't get any more impressive than that. But bad things happened to Jason, and at the age of 37, he found himself unemployed. His mother had passed away, and he was, I guess, lost is a good way to put it. He went on a discovery of self of self everything, and he has produced a book about the experience called "And I Breathed: My Journey from a Life of Matter to a Life That Matters." I am very excited to introduce you to Jason Gardner. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you doing today? Good, Jim. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Well, I've enjoyed your book. I have it here in my hand right now. You know, I get sent lots of free books, Jason, and I don't read a lot of them, I must admit, but I loved your book. It was fantastic and so honest. Well, first, thank you. I know that I know you probably do really get a whole bunch of books and and the investment that we as as authors ask people to take of, you know, 3 4 hours to sit and read a book is a huge amount of time and in today's world, so I, I always appreciate anyone who who reads it, and especially somebody who's as, as busy as you. And I think that was really my goal with the book. You know, I didn't want to write a music tell-all, and I didn't want to write a beat your chest, you know, look at the career I had um, kind of book. I think there's there's a lot of those, and there's many people who have a much sexier, more exciting kind of beat your chest. Story, but what I really wanted to share was what I had learned through that process, what was going on inside of my mind and inside of my heart. And to do that, I really I had to write a tell-all of a different kind. I had to write a tell-all about my own feelings, my my rise to the top, but the fear and the insecurity that that came with that. And then, you know, the the parts of of my life that were really challenging and and the heartbreaking nature of going through some of those things. And then the self-love and fulfillment that I have started to find at the, at the feet of some of these really great teachers. And I, and I just wanted to share that in a really open way that I, that I hoped that the readers who want, who were kind of in that same place in their life could look at this book as a friend and say, wow, this really sounds like something I'm going through and find a friend and not feel quite as alone as I did as I was going through it all. Right. Well, I love the combination in the book. It is a tell-all, but you've also got tons of great stories in here. You tell your entrepreneurial uh, life, the things that you've done. And so not only does it have some great little nuggets and stories in it, but it is very fulfilling on a very personal and very intimate level. I want to go back and dive into your past a little bit, Jason, before we get too much further in the book. You started off as a flea marking parking attendant, I believe. You didn't finish high school from what I recollect, and you worked up to, at the age of 37, you had been twice on the list of the, I think, Fortune highest uh, paid executives in entertainment. An amazing accomplishment. Tell us some of that story and how you became so successful so young. You know, it, it really was an obsessive subconscious drive for success. I was I was raised by a single mom uh, in a in a trailer in the Arizona desert, and uh, my mom worked you know two and sometimes three jobs uh, to put money on the table. And I and I remember you know falling asleep at night and hearing my mom in the other room crying, and 
just kind of bred in me this really intense desire and belief that if I made money, everything would be okay. And so, you know, for those first 37 years of my life, I didn't think about much other than how to make money. You know, I mean, it really was that that thing. And, and in the course of doing that, as I talk about later in the book, I neglected a lot of, you know, the care for my my own health and wellness and spiritual well-being. But, but really, I think like so many people in, in our culture, it was just this real belief that with that success would come happiness and, and fulfillment. And so, you know, I sold gum on the schoolyard when I was in middle school so that I could buy my lunch and not have to get the free lunch and the stigma in my mind that came with that. I sold roses on the corner on Valentine's Day. I worked in the parking lot at the flea market and then later had a series of entrepreneurial ventures at the flea market. And I went on to form my own concert company, which um, I ultimately was then brought over to a larger company and went on to become, as you said, the the CEO of Global Music uh, for Live Nation. And it was really one long um, or short, depending on how you look at it, just kind of drive of the little boy in me saying, I'm going to make something of myself. I'm going to be somebody. And when I do, everything's going to be okay. And the first part of that statement was true. I did make something of, of a life that I think wasn't, you wouldn't look at and say, hey, those are the ingredients that are going to get someone to where I got to. But the second part wasn't true. I, when I got there, I wasn't fulfilled. I wasn't happy. Everything wasn't okay. And your mother wasn't happy either, was she? No, you know, my mom um, my mom didn't have the financial success that I had in my life, but my mom definitely worked hard, and she touched just so many lives. She was a, a daycare teacher, um, and, you know, I remember as a little boy sitting in the corner at 6 o'clock waiting to go home from her daycare center where I would go after school to be with her, and there'd be this long line of kids waiting to get their hug from for my mom, and so in her really beautiful, tender way, she was just touching so many lives, but she was also taking in all of the fear and all of the insecurity and the sadness of of the world, and ultimately at age 59, it was too much for her, and um, she developed a very large tumor in her stomach, and it was diagnosed, and six months later, she died in in our arms at home. And it was really an eye-opening experience for me because I really looked at that experience and said, wow, this is also part of my destiny. You know, I'm I'm different than my mom in that I chose a different way to express myself in the world, different than my mom in that I made more money than my mom, but very similar in that it was just all about that output, all about doing, and not a lot of taking care of myself. And, you know, as I as I sat there crying, you know, no longer having a mom, I, you know, as a father of two at the time, I said, hey, this just can't be my story. And that's really when the changes in my life started to happen. Uh, Jason, I don't really have a question here. I just want to make a comment and then I will continue. The passage about your mother and the conversation with the priest or minister, um, your, I think his name was Paul, your religious friend, you know who I'm talking about? Yeah, you know, that was a really, so that was kind of, after Live Nation, I I started really looking for a spiritual outlet, and I I, I got um, in touch with a, with a Christian church, and um, one of the things that happened later in my life was that my mom um, fell in love with a woman, and ultimately married a woman, and, um, and so I'm here, I am part of this Christian church. And at the time, the issue of gay marriage came up, and my mom had already passed by this point. And I started to realize that everybody around me believed that my, you know, my dear mom was in hell. And, and so your mother, who had kids lining up to receive hugs yeah. from her, is in hell yeah. now. It's hard to yeah, believe. And, that, and again, I didn't have a question about this, Jason, and I don't really want to get into this part because I don't want to talk politics and religion and all of that. But <laughs> it was yeah. so profound. And the way you put it, I just want to say this to the listeners. This one uh, chapter is worth reading the whole book. Uh, Jason compares his mother, who lived like a saint, 
and then this Christian man said that he, the woman was now in hell, to a Chinese child who had never experienced uh, any sort of Christianity. And it was just powerful. And I wanted to say, your Christian leader gave you the wrong advice. I don't believe that that's what Christianity is about. I don't think that the girl in China who never experienced God goes to hell. You know, I don't know about your mother. I I think she's in heaven for the, all the hugs. There's a hugging heaven. There's a spe- special place in heaven for people who give out hugs to kids. Um, I think the girl in China ends up in heaven too. And I think that you got some bad biblical advice. Anyway, all of that's a tangential. I want to ask a question now. Why did you leave Live Nation at the age of 37? You know, the, the short answer is, I just couldn't do it anymore. You know, after after kind of being a part of such a profound experience as my mom passing in my arms and the deep connection that came around that, you know, I went back to work and I, I tried to dive back in as I always had done my whole life. And it just didn't matter anymore. And, and it wasn't fair. It wasn't fair to all the employees and the artists and everyone, you know, who needed someone in that job who was 100% dedicated to the job. And quite frankly, it wasn't fair to me to do something that was that I was no longer passionate about. And so I was really blessed that my boss and mentor and dear, dear friend, Michael Rapino, um, who who um, is the, the CEO of the, of the global company there at Live Nation, he, he really worked with me and we came up with a, a way for me to have a a graceful exit and a way for me to move on and and do what I'm doing now, which is just bringing me so much joy. All right. Before we get onto that, I want to do one celebrity story. I was actually, uh, I attended the cold play 2004 tour, uh, in Atlanta. You were the guy that organized that tour apparently. And I loved the show. It was a great show. So thank you. Tell me about your porn star mustache. (laughs) So I used to have a, very much 70s porn star looking mustache but at the time i didn't think that that was the case i thought i thought i looked pretty good and i thought the mustache <laughs> looked pretty good and um it was a leftover from kind of being a, a you know the youngest guy in the room all the time so i tried to look older with with a mustache and when i met chris martin the first time i knocked on the door to his dressing room and i introduced myself and said hi my name is jason and I'm here on this tour, you know, just to really try to make it a positive experience for you and do anything that you need. And he looked at me and smiled and said, you can start by shaving that porn star mustache and shut the door. And that began a two-year journey of me with them and Chris invariably teasing me about this mustache. And so one night in Los Angeles, we were having dinner. My boss, Michael, was there and Gwyneth Paltrow was there. And... Um, Michael asked how everything was and Chris told him everything was beautiful and that I was great and that there was just one problem and one easy problem, but that I wouldn't fix it for, for the band. And my boss said, what is it? And Chris said, Jason has that damn porn star mustache and he won't (laughs) shave it off. And so that night I went back to the hotel and I was probably the more nervous than I'd been in many years. And I shaved the mustache off. And the next day I met him and as he was coming out of the elevator and it became this long standing joke about me and my, my mustache that I shaved for the band. <laughs> well, that's a good one. All right, let's move on now at 37. Your mother dies very tragically. Uh, you transition out of your work. What's next? Talk about the process of writing this book of the self discoveries that you go through. And what was at the end of the process, Jason? Yeah, you know, the the beginning of the process was really an interesting realization that when I no longer had a job to point to, I didn't really know who I was. Men and define themselves by their work, don't we? I think we do. I think and I think more and more men and women in our entire culture, we really, you know, who are you? And the first thing we say is I work at yep. X or or I do I do this and so it was extremely difficult, but I had to find a new way to define myself. And that really sent me on this journey with a question, which was, who am I? And I went to the mountains of China. I studied at the Shaolin Temple. Um, I've studied with 
Guru Singh and Sharon Salzberg and just so many wonderful, David Wolf and so many wonderful teachers looking for an answer of who am I and then, you know, how do, how do, how do I fit into this go, go, go culture? And, and I don't mean I, Jason, but I mean kind of the universal us. How do our feelings and how do our lives fit into a world where we work 10-hour days or more and we're available on, on uh, Internet and social media and email all the time and we're bombarded with all of these demands? And I, and I really wanted to understand how I could find balance without having to live in the mountains of China full time, right? Because that's not that's not realistic, right? That's that's not real life spirituality. Right. And so, you know, and so that's really been this this journey and as I and as I started to have some answers and some new questions, um I just started to write them write them down and over a two week period I had kind of written my my life story from a perspective of just sharing. I didn't want to write a how to book or a self-help book. I really wanted to write just my journey of self-love and then hope that in sharing my journey really honestly, it would connect to to readers who, who were kind of on the same journey. And I think it's a great result. I love uh, the book, and I can't recommend it highly enough. Okay, Jason, here's the million-dollar question. Who are you? I think that I am, you know, at the deepest level, I am love. And at the deepest level, you are love. And then love or here, loved? Is there a D at the end of love. that word? Well, I, I hope it's both. But <laughs> okay, I, I think it's I think it's love without a D. I, I think that we're all this pure expression of life, which at its really core is kind of this unbiased love. And then, and then at the same time, we're very unique expressions, right? This is what we call the ego, right? with this very unique expression of that universal sentiment. And so you become Jim and I become Jason. And I think one of the challenges that we have is that we get too caught up in I'm Jim and I'm Jason and aren't we different? And we forget that at the core we're the same. And likewise, if we get too caught up in our sameness, we we lose that unique expression, that purpose that we're here is to be the unique perspective, you know, kind of if you look at a, a crystal and you shine it in the light and there's all these different perspectives of that crystal that appear on the wall and like we're, each one of us is is that. And so what that really says to me is that I have to learn to be un, unseparated, both kind of this spiritual being, but also this person that really has his or her feet on the ground walking through the world. And so I call that warrior monk, which is something I learned in China with the Shaolin monks, which is within us is a warrior. And in, in China, these monks are Kung Fu warriors, and they're also Zen Buddhist monks, and it's this really odd mix. But I think that's all of us. So in, in me is a warrior who can go out and do business, can pull out the sword when it's necessary. But in me is also this monk who can use serenity and calmness and love and kindness when that's appropriate as well. And so when you put both of those together, we have this ability to be compassionate and be strong. We have the ability to be both um, serene and wise. We have the ability to be both sharp and loving. And you put that together, and now we have a toolbox that we can walk into the world and have a full expression of ourselves. What are some of the things that you learned that you can share with us um, habits that we can change, something that we can do to make ourselves more successful? For me, it's, it's all about daily practice. So, you know, I think when I was in business, I had a daily practice that looked like don't well, jump up out of bed, um, grab my BlackBerry at the time, check my email, rush through the day, don't breathe, don't eat well, work, 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 and then stress about work when I was at, at home. And I think that daily practice describes so many Everyone. people's yep. lives, right? And and so what I've learned is that I now get up a little bit earlier. I start the day at 6 or 6.30. I start the day by breathing. Then I stretch. You might call it yoga. I then sit and I do some meditation. And then throughout the day, I nurture my body 
with green juices and smoothies and things that really tell my body that I'm loved. If you think about your body as a community of cells, exactly identical to the community at your work. You know, we have thousands of people who work in companies, and if the boss comes to work and screams and yells and flogs the workers into getting more and more done and never shows appreciation, we eventually, that organization will get sick. And that's really what happens to our, our body. And so when we take time to stretch, when we take time to breathe, when we take time to nurture ourselves, it's like good leadership of ourselves. It's that compassionate leadership that we wish our boss exhibited, and some of us have those bosses who do exhibit it. It's that kind of leadership within the community, within ourselves. And so what I really learned is you don't have to check out of life, don't have to go to the mountains, but you do if you want to live a life of fulfillment and a life that you know has a little bit deeper matter to it than just all the physical things that, that we acquire. You do have to care for yourself, and you do have to learn to listen, and you do have to learn to love yourself. And in that process, that's where that magic balance that everybody talks about starts to happen. We won't ever balance the time because we spend 10 hours at the office, but we can start to introduce this idea that our feelings matter, that we're loved, that we care for ourselves along with caring for our business. And in there, I really have found magic starting to fruit in my life. And what's next for you, Jason? I don't know. You know, I, I right now I'm really enjoying sharing this book, and um, I have a few clients that I consult with on on stuff like everything that we talked about today, and uh, we'll just kind of see what what comes next. It's been such a beautiful adventure, going all the way back to the the days of working at the flea market, and um, I'm sure something beautiful is is going to continue to come out of life. Star that you're most excited to have met. You know, I, I always go back to Enrique Iglesias um, because he was the first concert I promoted. And um, I just went to one of his shows the other day. He invited me down. And um, when I walked into the arena and I stood off to the side of the stage and he saw me and he walked over and from the microphone said, I'm so happy you're here. And it was for me, that was just kind of this expression of, you know, I no longer I no longer represent the guy who signs checks at his concerts. And yet here's a, here's a friend who just says, what really matters is you're here for me. And I think if we can learn to be that in the world, that's really a life that that's successful. And, and that was really fulfilling. So I, I, I always pick him because of that deep friendship and love. Well, I like his music too. So uh, he has that going as well. Tell <laughs> your son, Kevin, that Coca-Cola is infinitely better than Pepsi, okay? Will you get that clear in your house for me? And, <laughs> Jason, how can we buy the book, find out more about you, follow you on Twitter, that kind of thing? Um, my website is jasongarner.com, and uh, we sell the book right from there. I self-published it because um, I didn't like being told what the book had to say or had to do, and so by self-publishing it, you know, it's a a true expression of what was in my heart at the time. And my Twitter is um, the Jason Garner. And, but you can find it all off the website at jasongarner.com. Fantastic. Jason, thank you so much for sharing this book with us and your story. And I hope you'll come back on the show again and tell us about the next chapter in your life. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. Take all right. Care. 